In this short video, let's do this. Let's spend a few minutes quickly summarizing the key features of callable bonds. Let's begin with the definition first. Think of a callable bond to be one which has an embedded call option in it. Now remember, this call option is a short call option as will be clear as we move forward. It's a bond with an embedded call option. This call option lies with the issuer. If the issuer were to choose to exercise this call option, it means that the issuer can early redeem the bond prior to its stated maturity date at a pre-specified price which we refer to as the call price. So simply put, a callable bond is one which may not survive till its stated maturity date at the choice or discretion of the issuer of the bond, the bond may be early redeemed prior to its maturity date at a pre-specified price which is the call price, okay, as simple as that. Let's take a look at what sort of motivation will the issuer of the bond have to prefer a callable bond over and above an equivalent bond which is a non-callable one, I mean without any embedded option but which has the same coupon and maturity, okay. So the callable bond, remember that it grants to the issuer some kind of protection against declining interest rates. Now, why would the issuer want this kind of protection? It's because the callable bond is like a liability for the issuer. If interest rates were to go down, it means that the size or the value of the liability goes up. Now, that's not a very welcome scenario for the issuer. The issuer therefore welcomes the protection which the callable bond offers. Now let's try and digest this using another approach. If the level of interest rates goes down or for that matter if the credit health of the issuer were to improve which means that the credit spread associated with you know anything which the issuer issues were to go down okay it means that the borrowing cost of the issuer has lowered, it's gone down. If the outstanding bonds of this particular issuer are callable bonds, then it means that the issuer can take advantage of the lowered borrowing cost. What the issuer can do is that he can call back the existing bonds and maybe reissue new bonds which are at a lower coupon, which carry a lower coupon. That way, the issuer would have taken advantage of the lowered borrowing cost. So this is the issuer's motivation. Now let's take a look at the buyer's motivation. Up until now, it seems that a callable bond is purely in the best interests of the issuer. Well, that's true because the buyer, he is carrying an additional risk if he buys this callable bond and this risk is reinvestment risk. We've seen that a bond, which is a callable bond, is likely to be called back if interest rates are low. The holder of the bond, what he receives when that callback happens is the pre-specified call price. Now, when the holder of the bond tries to reinvest this call price, which he has received, then the rate of return which he can reinvest this call price at will be a lowered rate of return because interest rates have gone down, okay? So the buyer, he faces this risk which is reinvestment risk and therefore to entice the buyer into holding a callable bond, the price of the callable bond has to go down. It has to be lower as compared to the price of an equivalent bond of same coupon and maturity but without any embedded option okay a lower price basically means that the callable bond it has to offer a higher yield for the investor to buy the callable bond okay so the buyer's motivation is that a callable bond offers you higher yield now let's take a look at how the mechanics of this embedded call option work how the call will happen is clearly specified in the bonds indenture. In this indenture, we have something like a table, which we refer to as a call schedule. This table clearly tells us on what all dates can the issuer call back the bond and at what 
price at what call price basically i am allowing this possibility that the call price can vary depending on the date on which the issuer decides to call back the bond typically this call price tends to decrease towards the par value of the bond as we keep moving forward in time now keep this thing in mind that the call provision you know it can it allows the issuer to call back the bond either at a fixed price or it may happen that the call provision works via what we refer to as a make whole provision a make whole provision is one in which we won't have a fixed pre-specified price but what we what we will have is like a pre-specified spread that we apply on top of the prevailing benchmark interest rate and based on what we get we will basically discount all the outstanding cash flows of the bond and we will compute something like a price on the fly okay so that's what we refer to as a make whole provision something which the buyer of the bond would welcome as compared to this fixed price okay now let's take a look at a quick value decomposition of a callable bond let's call the value of a callable bond at any point in time to be v underscore cb and the value of an equivalent non-callable bond as v underscore nc the value of a callable bond is always the minimum or the lower of the value of an equivalent non-callable bond and the prevailing call price or the applicable call price. Why is that so? Because if the value of the non-callable bond were to go up because interest rates have gone down, in the case of a callable bond, the issuer can always step in and call back the bond at the applicable call price. So the value of the callable bond will not rise the same way as the value of a non-callable bond will. Okay. So with this as our guiding relationship between callable and non-callable, I can actually twist it around and arrive at this relationship. And that is the value of a callable bond, remember, is the value of a non-callable equivalent non-callable bond that minus the value of an embedded call option okay so when i say minus it means that from the buyer's perspective it's a short option position it's like the buyer of the callable bond has sold a call option to the issuer of the callable bond okay and that's why in return for selling this call option to the issuer he has received a higher yield okay now since we have done this value decomposition and it's telling us that the callable bond has an embedded short call option position in it to value this embedded call option position we might not really have a closed form analytical formula with us therefore what we have to do is we have to switch for pricing purpose to a numerical scheme. For example, simplest one being using the binomial model. Okay, so just something to keep in mind. Next, let's take a look at the price versus yield relationship of a callable bond. If I were to plot the P versus Y of a non-callable bond, then I know that it's an inverse relationship and this graph is a convex graph. Okay. Now, this formula, it tells me that callable is equal to non-callable minus the call, the embedded call. And therefore, if I were to now plot on the same graph, the plot of how the callable bond behaves with respect to the general level of interest rates, then this guy comes out to be lower than the graph or the plot for the non-callable bond. The vertical distance between these two, the green and the red, it denotes the value of this embedded call option. Now, based on that, let's observe three things. The first thing which I'll observe is that since the vertical distance is the value of the call option, the value of the call option is dependent on the general level of the interest rate. If the interest rates are high, we know that that's a scenario in which the issuer of the bond will not likely call back the bond. 
there is no incentive for the issuer to call back the bond when interest rates are high. So in this region, you will see that the two curves are quite close to one another. The value of this call option is actually tiny. The value of the call option increases when interest rates fall. Take a look at this region of the curve. In this region, the value of the call option is quite sizable. Okay, that's the first thing to observe. The second thing to observe is that if I were to clearly mark on this graph the call price, let that be you know, marked by this dashed line. I told you that because of the presence of the call option, the embedded call option, the value of the, the callable bond will never rise above the applicable call price. And that's what we have here, okay? This is the call price. The value of the callable bond is keeping below. It's rising, yes, when interest rates fall, but it's still keeping below this horizontal line. We can say that it's experiencing something like a price compression. That's the second thing to note, okay? And that is when interest rates fall, the value or the price of a callable bond, it suffers from price compression. The third thing to note is that take a look at the green plot. The green plot I told you is a convex relationship between P and Y. Convexity of this green graph is positive. Take a look at the red one now. In this region where interest rates are high, the P versus Y is still a convex relationship. This part of the curve is still convex. When you take a look at this part of the curve, it's actually switched from convex to concave okay and therefore the convexity of this portion of the curve is negative the convexity of this portion of the curve is positive so we start with positive at high values of interest rates and we switch to negative at low values of interest rates and therefore there must be a point along this curve at which the value of the convexity must have been a zero okay something to remember next Let's take a look at interest rate risk of a callable bond as measured by the duration. Now, first thing to note here is that the duration, the concept of the duration as it applies to a callable bond, it may actually be difficult to apply. The reason being that duration, we generally define it with the interest rate factor chosen to be the YTM, the yield to maturity. Now, in the case of a callable bond, it may not even survive till its stated maturity date. And hence, it's pretty difficult for us to define something called a yield to maturity of a callable bond. So therefore, what we do is, we do define the duration, yes, but we define it with respect to, let's say, a parallel shift in the term structure of interest rates. That's how we will compute duration. The second aspect to note about duration is that since we do not have a closed form analytical formula to determine the price of a callable bond, we can't really calculate duration or express duration as this formula, minus one over P dP over dy. We can't do that because we do not know P as a clear function of Y. So what we do is, we switch to the concept of effective duration. That means we will compute duration using our pricing method, which let's say is binomial tree pricing. And what we'll do is we will compute this effective duration by bumping the entire term structure of interest rates up, let's say by an amount delta y. We compute the value of the callable bond as V plus bumping the entire term structure of interest rates down again by delta y computing the value of the callable bond in the bumped down state and we compute the value of this bond in the base state one in which we haven't introduced any bump based on these three values bumped up bumped down and the base i can compute the effective duration using this formula now take a look at this graph now this this callable versus callable versus non-callable p versus y okay now based on this i know that when interest rates are high the two curves are very close to one another in this region of interest rates i would imagine that the duration of a callable bond and the duration of a non-callable bond 
will be quite close to one another. When interest rates are low, then price compression tells me that if Y were to go down, then the non-callable bond, it enjoys a much greater increase in price as compared to a callable bond. And therefore, when interest rates are low, I can believe that the duration of a callable bond should be lower as compared to the duration of a non-callable bond. So keeping both these scenarios in mind, I can write down that the duration of a callable bond, mind you, its effective duration should be less than or equal to the duration of a non-callable bond, okay? Next, let's take a look at the interest rate risk convexity of a callable bond. Again, I would have to switch to something like an effective convexity because I don't have a closed form formula to price a callable bond and I can compute effective convexity as this formula. Bump up, bump down minus two times the base divided by the base delta y squared. Okay. Lastly, option adjusted spread. Now, the formula for OAS we know is this. It's the Z spread or the spread which is required to match the market price of the bond assuming that the volatility of interest rates is zero. That's called the Z spread. So OAS is Z spread minus the value of the embedded option expressed in bips per year. Okay. For a callable bond, our chosen sign convention, it tells us that the value of this option is positive and it tells us that the OAS of a callable bond, remember, is less than the Z spread of a callable bond. Okay, So OAS is less than the Z spread for a callable bond. That's the key takeaway which I want you to remember. Okay, So this was a quick look at the various features of a callable bond that we have to keep in mind.